you know, there was this anger in me and there was this desire in me to become someone who can defend themselves, to become someone really strong, because I wasn't strong. I grew up an only child in a house that had a lot of anger and pain and abuse. I definitely dealt with some pretty serious bullying in my high school years. One time, uh, a guy was beating on me in class and I looked at the teacher and she said, and I said, are you gonna do anything? And she said, well, you probably deserve it. I was searching for people who would, who would really love me and that I could love back. When I turned 17, I joined the military against my mom's desire. We had, we had to force her to sign the document, <laughs> my dad did. <laughs> and they gave me a special forces slot, which uh, would give me the opportunity to be the baddest dude I, I could become. Uh, the only problem was I went to uh, the medical review and I failed the colorblind test. They said, well, you've got two options. You can be a admin specialist, which <laughs> then I started crying because to go from special forces to admin, now we're, now we're struggling here. <laughs> and then they offered me the other position, which would be a chaplain's assistant. And I said, which one do I have a better chance of killing terrorists and getting shot at? And they said, uh, maybe chaplain's assistant. And I said, all right, I, I want that one. <laughs> you know, I deployed to Iraq when I was uh, 21 years old. We got into Iraq, and on the sixth day of my tour, uh, one of our helicopters uh, went down and seven of our guys were killed. And I remember my uh, chaplain waking me up at, um, you know, four or five o'clock in the morning and I remember seeing his face and he looked at me and he said, we have, we have a fallen angel and we've lost First Sergeant Rodriguez, we've lost Anthony Mason and, and several others. And I remember my, my chaplain counseled soldiers for about 40 straight hours, one after another, after another, after another, that was just devastated. We held the memorial service and then the next day it was like it, um, it was like it never even happened. We took that pain and we put it away and we, we drove on. Several months later, there was a small town outside of our base and one day uh, a suicide bomber walked into uh, the school that was there and blew himself up. Our base hospital took in those kids and my chaplain and I went to the hospital and um, you know, I saw, I saw children with parts of their faces missing and missing limbs, and um, and I just stood there, looking and and taking all this in and and feeling um, feeling frozen, and all those feelings of wanting to be a hero or a combat dude, and you know, wanting to be, become something great, and I remember just feeling helpless. I came home and it was a couple weeks after I came home that I began having nightmares and tremors that, um, uh, that I was killing children. And I would wake up in just a pool of sweat, screaming, crying out to Jesus. And that, that began a really dark time in my life where I turned back to what I knew before I gave my life to Jesus and started drinking and partying again to try and fill that hole and to deal with what was happening. And the PTSD I was dealing with, I felt like a complete monster. I just went out one night and got so drunk and I came home and I remember having handgun and, and processing why I should take my life and that that would actually make more sense than going on like this. And I called my uh, mentor at three o'clock in the morning, choking through tears, crying and just saying, why? Why did we lose our guys that day? Why am I experiencing this trauma? Why is this happening? And he just said to me, Ben, when the disciples lost Jesus, it was the most devastating moment of their lives. And I was pretty pissed off at him that he started giving me a Bible lesson, but I figured I'd stick it out with him. And he said, the disciples who had followed Jesus for three years and watched him do the impossible, you know, they thought that 
he was going to set up shop and become the king and use all of his power. But instead, he goes and gets taken away and is beaten within an inch of his life and he dies on a cross. They didn't understand. And what they couldn't see in the midst of all that pain was the greatest victory that the world had ever known, and that was Jesus dying for our sins and for the sins of the world. And he said, Ben, that's where you are. You are in that place where you're in so much pain and you don't understand why, but there's a, there's a Jesus victory beneath it. And if you hang in there, you're gonna come back to life. Just like Jesus rose from the dead, you're gonna rise back to life and you're gonna have a fulfillment of a promise in your life. And I said, okay, I can believe that. I'll tell you here and now that um, it didn't get any easier, but week by week, month by month, I began to re-engage my faith, get around people who would support my journey. One of the biggest things that I learned was a phrase that has given me so much clarity, that helplessness produces rage. And all those situations, which I know so many veterans we, we, we can relate to, of standing over someone while they're bleeding out and they're dying and you feel helpless. But what I've found is that we have to go back to the root of that helplessness so that we can have clarity for that rage and allow the love of Jesus to come into that so that we don't have to be angry anymore. That's what he's done for me and that's what he's continuing to do. When I walked off the bus coming home from Iraq, the first thing that I saw is 100 Vietnam veterans lined up shoulder to shoulder holding the American flag and guarding my welcome home. And then God gave me this vision of what it would be like to honor these Vietnam veterans because they've never been honored and they've never been welcomed home. That's where God is taking us so that we can bring anything that has died in them to life in their hearts and for their families. so hopeless and in darkness, but with God, I have found life beyond what I could have ever thought was possible, and I'm watching my dreams unfold before me. My name is Ben Peterson, and I am second. Amen. All through life, we come up against situations that seem hopeless. But there's a God who brings hope to the hopeless. My question for you this morning is how do we or how do you handle grief of sin in your life and the evil and sin of the world. We just watched Ben Peterson pour his heart out. So many of our veterans live with PTSD. And for those of you that don't know, Su Susan is a trauma therapist. That's what she specializes in. Uh, utilizing a methodology called EMDR. But without Christ in your life, it is very difficult to move past part A to part B. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. We're in verse 4 this morning. Um, and if you would like, I'd like to, as I have the last couple of weeks, read through the first verses, uh, the first 12 verses of the Beatitudes, uh, or chapter 5. Uh, if you want to stand, that's great. Um, if you can, that, that would be awesome. Uh, let's read together chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. 
And he opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And blessed are the the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11, blessed are those, or blessed are you, when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That's God's word this morning. You may be seated. Last week, we began the first of the Beatitudes, and we looked at the poor in spirit. And it wasn't about uh, poor from a monetary standpoint. It was literally being so poor in your heart that you have nothing but to rely upon Christ himself. You have to lose everything to understand what Christ will actually provide. And so we must be fully dependent on him. And today, this Sunday, we look at the sincere sorrow for sin. Our sin and the sin of others. Our series is Character in the Face of Adversity. This morning's sermon message is crybaby. And sometimes we literally have to cry like a baby to get it all out. To, to know that, that once we get it all out, there is this comfort that is going to come to us from God himself. It's not always easy, man. We want to hold that bitterness in. We, we don't want to admit to the sin that we have in our lives. We don't want to uh, 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 let ourselves be vulnerable so that we could let go of ourselves and let God do what it is that he plans for us. This is part three of our series, and we're going through the Beatitudes. It's the first sermon that... Christ gives, and chapters 5, 6, and 7 are collectively known as the Sermon on the Mount. What's been happening? Well, Jesus is sitting and he's teaching like a rabbi would. And his 12 are attentive, and the crowds are are seeing a different side of the Savior. What do I mean by that? As we've talked about, prior to the Sermon on the Mount, he was going around and he was healing and there were signs and there were wonders and all of this is taking place, but now it's a little bit different. He goes up, he sits in an authoritative posture as a rabbi would sit amongst his congregation And he begins to teach about the kingdom of heaven. And he begins to teach what it means for us as believers, what it means for us to to give wholeheartedly ourselves over to him so that we might experience the gift that he has for us. Our first point this morning is careless about sin. And I I thought about the the point topic titles this past week as I was working through the text. 
and I thought about myself specifically. Am I careless about sin? Am I, am I just kind of haphazardly going through life thinking to myself, eh, that's not that big a deal. And as I continue to walk that walk, is it becoming easier and easier and easier for me to, to give justification for that sin in my life? And then taking it a step further, is it easier and easier for me to allow for the sin that exists in the world? Am I, as the text tells us in verse 4, am I mourning in such a way that God will lift the sin in me away and lift the sin of the world away? Or am I just kind of walking, careless about sin? The Greek word... um, in its, in its root form, is uh, pentheo. And uh, we, it's used a little bit differently uh, in the sense that, uh, of, of who uh, the author is addressing, who Matthew is writing uh, to. Um, and so it's more uh, in a plural form as an adjective, um, but it means to mourn. And to experience sadness of grief as a result of depressing circumstances or the condition of persons. So it is reflective of what's going on in me, and it's reflective of how things are happening outside of me. Verse 4 says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The reference here is is not to grieving or or, uh, mourning for the dead, but rather sadness and grief because of wickedness and oppression. And I think that everybody will agree with me this morning that there is an inordinate amount of wickedness and depression in the world. I had a conversation with somebody this morning, and and there are things going on in life. And, And we asked that question as Ben Peterson asked the question, why? Why? And, and, and why would God forgive something like that? And the answer is not for us to understand. The answer is for us to truly give that over to the Lord. The Lord is going to handle whatever that particular situation is. And it's easy to say it. It's another thing to walk it, and it's another thing to, to forgive, right? It's hard to forgive when somebody does you wrong. You carry that burden with you. But again, I read, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Sometimes you have to let go of whatever it is that's burdening you so that God can continue to use you because the person that you're angry at They've moved on. (laughs) You're the one who's upset about something they don't even know about anymore. We're careless about sin. You see, sin is not necessarily uh, doing something wrong. Sin is an attitude. Sin is unforgiveness. Um, Christ went to the cross and forgave every single one of us. And the last time I checked, not a single one in this sanctuary is perfect. It's an imperfect place that we are in. We are imperfect people. We are people who were born into sin, and only by the grace of God are we forgiven of that sin. And Christ himself went to the cross bearing all of our sin on his shoulders. And we sometimes, we got to think about that. We, we got to understand what that really looks like. You know, the beatitude 
uh, is uh, actually an Old Testament promise um, to those who will participate in the future kingdom. Why would Christ give us Old Testament perspective? Because he is showing us the fulfillment of the prophecy. He is sitting and teaching to Jewish um, people who are not believers in him at this point. But how else, if we know our audience, what do we do? We speak to what it is that they can understand. And that's what he's doing here. And in the sense that he's pointing out the sin in their lives, he's giving them an opportunity to get on their knees and cry out to God like a baby would cry and do what? Ask for forgiveness. Ask him to lift that burden that we are in a position where we could mourn so fervently and not understand the circumstance of today but feel the comfort of Christ all the way through it. We should be mourning over the sin in our lives because all of us have it. I'm the first one to raise my hand in admission to the sin that's in my life. It could be a moment in the way that I speak to my wife. It could be a glance. It, 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 could, uh, it could be uh, anything. Listen, uh, Wednesday night, I, I snapped at somebody. And if not for accountability in my life, I might not have known it. And that's how important something like that is. And I have to ask for forgiveness at that point. I'm not perfect. We make mistakes. But we have to also understand that it's not only about us. There is, an, a, is a great deal of sin in our world today. We all know what it is. I don't have to go into the details of it. But we need to be mourning over the sin in the world today that God might bring comfort and restitution and revival to us so that we might walk through this sin in the world. Remember that Christ said to us in in the Gospel according to John, chapter 16, verse 33, that the world is going to hate you. You're going to have trouble. You've got to understand that in this time, if you are admitting to loving me, you have to know that they're going to hate you the way that they hate me. And we're experiencing that right now, today. He says this one very specific thing, though, at the end of that verse. He says, don't sweat the small stuff, zone paraphrase. Why? Because I've overcome the world. And we have great hope in that. And just in that statement alone brings comfort, no matter what it is that we happen to be walking through. And we walk through stuff. It's just the way it is. Listen, Ben Peterson, who we just saw in the video, I Am Second, Ben could not, recon- could not reconcile the crazy of a rock until he turned it over to Jesus. He was sitting with a handgun in his hand, ready to pull the trigger, Because he couldn't wrap his arms around it. And here's the thing. God tells us you can't wrap your hands around it. There's no way you can, or your arms around that circumstance. Until you give it over to me, it's impossible. Yeah, we're going to get angry. Yes, we're going to be frustrated over what other people do. Yes, we see all of that. But the reality is, get on... uh, uh, a plane or a place where you can cry out to God like a little baby. For those of you that have children, who have raised children in your life, you know what it's like for an infant to start to cry because they're hungry. It is this fervent 
you would think they were dying. And, and they just hadn't eaten in a couple hours. Right? God wants us to cry out like a baby like that so that he can put his hand upon us and give us the comfort that we desire. Here's my second point this morning. On my knees. Get on your knees. It's time. It's time to stop jibber-jabbering about it. It's time to get on your knees and cry out to God. The condition of the human heart is... It's so complicated, I don't even know how to to put it into words that it makes sense. Our, Our heart goes in a million different directions, and our heart speaks to our head, and our head speaks to our heart, and before too long, we're in la la land someplace trying to figure it all out. Ben Peterson, at his age, because of what he suffered, wanted nothing more than to be the guy. I want to be the guy. Special forces. I'm colorblind. Changes everything. We must be bankrupt. Listen to this very carefully. We must be bankrupt spiritually. And then the grace of God can be introduced. but you have to be bankrupt. Let it all go. I know people in my life, they're strong, strong people. Sometimes you got to let that strength go and understand it's not you, but Christ in you. And so we look at this, um, we, we... uh, in, in this next point, we are to mourn over sin and its consequences. See, I think sometimes we are, it's easy for us to say, I'm sorry, but we forget about the consequences of the sin that might be uh, permeating in our lives. But it's not enough on our own sin. We have to mourn over the sin of others. Why? Because we can be an intercessor. We, in our prayer, can be intercessor prayer warriors to recognize that God will move when we call out to him. Not just in our lives, but in the lives of those around us. We mourn like this because our loyalty is to the kingdom. My loyalty in this life, yes, Susan is my wife, and I have a loyalty towards her, but my kingdom loyalty is to Jesus Christ, first and foremost. And so we... Uh, We mourn like this because of our loyalty to the kingdom. We mourn over sin and affliction. True repentance is what God is looking for. He's not interested in your I'm sorry. My my kids used to say, oh, daddy, I'm sorry. And then he'd turn around and do the same thing over again. I tell Susan that all the time. Oh, Susan, I'm sorry. And then I turn around and I do the same thing all over again. Thankfully, she loves me. I'm just saying. Well, she tolerates me, let me just say. Our focus tends to drift toward affliction. Oh, woe is me. Why did this happen to me? Look at me. Me, me, me. That's not what God is asking for. God is saying, tell me about your sin. Repent of that sin. Mourn 
mourn over that sin as if you were mourning over somebody who just passed away. Think about it. When somebody close to you has passed away, you mourn. In, 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 as a Jew, when somebody passes away, you mourn for 30 days. You tear your clothing. We don't tear our clothing anymore. Typically, we take a little piece of black cloth and we pin it to the lapel. We don't shave. We sit on wooden boxes. We sit shiver. We mourn over the loss, Right? Here's the difference. When a Christian dies that we know is Christian, we rejoice in knowing that to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Lord. But if we are not mourning over the sin in our lives, how are we going to move past that sin? It's not enough to say sorry. You must repent. That means turn away from that sin. That sin may be no more. That's what God is asking us to do. And so we do that. We need true repentance. Our focus tends to drift toward the affliction, as I mentioned. Focus our mourning to sin and evil in our lives. In the world, or even, dare I say, in the church. That's, that's another thing that's hard for people to swallow, because why? We walk into a church and our expectation is perfection. These are Christians. They're godly people. They don't make mistakes. They, they're Christians, and so they're perfect now. Yeah, not now. Anybody who's been in church for any length of time, you've seen enough go on in churches to, to, to shake your head and go, this is church? Are you kidding me? Who are these people? But God tells us to focus our mourning uh, 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 to sin and evil in our lives to the world, yes, focus our mourning on the world because the world literally is going to hell in a, hasp, in a hand basket. And yes, as I have been mentioning over the last several weeks, why so much I want people to sign up and be a part of the prayer teams that we're trying to put together. Why? Because we have to pray for our church. Because there's sin in the church. Every church. Because it's filled with sinners. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a reality of the world. We, we mourn because the righteous suffer and the wicked prevail. How many times have you found yourself looking at somebody going, that, that is the most wicked individual I've ever seen in my life. How in the world are they so successful? Look at the car they're driving. Look at the house they're living in. Look at the money that they throw around. And they're horrible. I'm sitting here. I'm, I've given my life over to Christ. I'm a prayer warrior. I do whatever it is that God calls me to do. In Acts 1.80, he tells me to go to the ends of the earth. I go to the ends of the earth. Why am I in the plight of, of crazy that I'm in and that person over there got everything going on. They could care less if you say Jesus or don't say Jesus. They don't believe in him. They don't care. Everything they've done is in their own strength. We then turn around and we say what? God's moving too slow. He's not moving fast enough. I asked him to get me this house that I really want. Or I asked God, I want to go on this incredible vacation. I need the money to do it. What, what, hello? Uh, timing. Let's go. I, I need it now. i got to pay for it. Where is it? God never moves fast enough for us. We need to mourn in our prayer in all circumstances. Every circumstance. Pray for that sinner, quote unquote, who does not have a relationship with Christ. Every one of us, 
I, I'm making a broad assumption, have people in our families who don't know Christ, who make it very difficult for you to share what it is that's happened in your life. Some, sometimes you have people in your family who say that they're Christian, but there is no, no, nothing that would exhibit that in their lives. They're Christian because their mother was a Christian, their father was a Christian, they, they went to church their whole life, but they've never given their lives over to Christ. They never did. You can go to church all you want until, until you repent and recognize that it is Jesus who is Lord and turn from that sin and ask Jesus into your life. You're just going to church. All these people that were sitting around by the mountain, they weren't all believers. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. We mourn over suffering and distress in general. We got to be on our knees praying about that. We also look at those who mourn because they must turn in uh, uh, turn in faith to Jesus. We got nothing if we don't have Jesus. I'm just telling you. You're going to have a good time for the, let's say, anywhere from, I don't know, you know, if you get lucky enough to hit 80, 90, then what? Because based on, based on what God tells us in his word, that's a blink of an eye, and eternity is not there for me. <laughs> I don't want to go to that other place. So you got to think about that. Well, as we think about that, what do we need? What do we need? I need a comforter. Our third point, I need a comforter. Somebody who's going to wrap their arms around me and, and give me the peace that I'm looking for. And in verse 4, this is the importance of what Christ is saying. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Peter mourned. Listen, we all know what Peter did. He denied Christ three times. He, he did all kinds of crazy nonsense, Peter. If you look at Peter and he was around today, he'd be in jail someplace for all the nonsense. But see, here's the difference. Peter mourned with real godly sorrow. He repented. And as a result, became what? He became the pillar of the church. He goes and preaches on the day of Pentecost and just rocks their world. God empowered him even in the midst of his sin just like he will empower every single one of us in the midst of our sin when we mourn in true sorrow and repentance. He comforts. He was forgiven. But here's the flip side to that. Well, who's the flip side to Peter? Judas. See, Judas was remorseful. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do it. They made me do it. They made me do it. I'm so sorry. But he wasn't repentant at all. He did it. He didn't really care. He just wanted, he wanted Jesus to forgive him because he, he messed up. But he never gave an indication that he would be able to move forward from that moment and do it again. And what does Judas do? He kills himself over it. He was remorseful, but not repentant. In our mourning, we will receive God's approval. And I don't think there's one of us here this morning that does not seek the approval of our Father in heaven, who does not seek the approval of the Son that he sent to die on the cross. 
who does not seek the approval of the Spirit who dwells in every one of us who says we're a believer. We got one God who split himself up in three parts so that we would be encouraged, we would be comforted, we would know that no matter what our circumstance is, he's right there with us. Ooh, that's a hello, how do you do? We are comforted by knowing Christ is coming back for his saints and he's going to judge. See, if you, if you rewind for a second, that, that guy, that lady who gets everything, could care less about the Lord, and you sit and you go, Why? He's coming back to judge. 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us what? All of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of what it is that we have done. Through God's grace that we experience great joy And comfort of forgiveness is given. But you've got to be willing to, to give it up. We will be delivered. Listen carefully. We will be delivered from all evil in the day of Christ Jesus. I, I mention this verse on, on a fairly regular basis, but Philippians 1.6 says, He who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. He's coming back for us. You, you're going to have to walk whatever path it is that he has laid out for you. For some, it's going to seem easier uh, than it is for others, but God has laid out the perfect path for each and every one of us. He knows what we can handle. He, he pushes us through that. And even in our, our difficult times, he's never left us. And he never will. Susan and I watched a, a movie yesterday called The Covenant, which was actually about the war in Afghanistan, but it made me think about that word covenant. God has made a covenant with each and every believer that says that once you call on me, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I knew you, I know you, and I know everything that's going to happen for you. That's pretty impressive. Beware of the sorrow of this world, but know Jesus has your back probably one of my famous favorite sayings of all. Jesus has got your back. Don't worry. No man left behind. All right? Turn with me quickly to um, 2 Corinthians um, chapter 7. Um, it's so funny. I marked another scripture that I didn't get to and did not mark the scripture that I wanted to get to. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses uh, 8 through 10. Listen to, to what Paul wrote. He says, For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that uh, that letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of what? Repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. Verse 10. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. When you put 
everything into God, God puts everything into you. He, in the midst of sorrow, will lift you up and bring you where you need to be. I'll get it. Hello. Um, you see, no, nobody who's watching knows that I, I hear the phone, uh, but that's okay. Um, in conclusion, and Cliff's going to come up and, and we're going to um, have our normal time of prayer, and um, I want to say this. Look, it, it's not easy to wrap your arms around difficult situations. I know that. You know that. You know, you're going to sit, you look at me and you go, Pastor, you're not, you're not dealing with what I'm dealing with, right? I, I, and I'm not. Uh, but you're not dealing with what I deal with either. And um, so um, it, it's not easy to wrap your arms around difficult situations, yours or another's. God calls us to be dependent on him for everything. And it's easy for me to say it. It's another thing to actually put it into practice. But he wants us to be dependent on him for everything. Why? Because he is the one who will bring comfort. He's going to bring comfort in this world. He's going to bring uh, uh, comfort when he returns for us. And in the middle of your trial, even though you might not realize it, he's going to bring you comfort. What does Paul write in, in, in Philippians? He says, may the peace and comfort that surpasses all understanding cover you. God is a God of comfort. And perhaps you're struggling today. I, I don't know. Um, but you don't know how to fix the problem in your life. Whatever that problem is, I want you to know that Jesus has the answer. He's got the answer. L look in his word. That's the best place to start. Believe, listen to me, believe in him and you will be saved and you will receive the comfort you seek to get through whatever it is that's going on in your life. And I say this every week. I have since, well, since February 2nd minimum, 2015. If you've never asked Jesus into your life, then perhaps today is that day. The day that you say, you know, I, I'm sorrowful, but I'm not repentant, and I need to be repentant. God is calling us to repentance, that you might experience the love that he has for you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Take a moment right now, just put a, as, as we say so often, this is so Southern Baptist, but I'm going to say it anyway, put a, put a box around you. Don't worry about who's next to you, in front of you, behind you. But take a moment right now and look at your life and determine, am I truly repentant of all the things that are going on? Or am I just, hey, I'm sorry. Because if you're just sorry, maybe it's time to repent and give your life over to Christ. The scriptures tell us that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, we will be saved. For the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life with him. Woo, what a promise. Let me pray with you. Father, right now, God, I lift each and every person up. And as they have this box around them and they become reflective of what it is that's going on in their lives, may there be one person amongst us who turns their life over to you and truly repents of the sin in their life, turns from that sin, steps out of their dark world and into the light of Christ. God, I thank you for that person. I praise you for what it is that you're going to do in their lives. And I just ask this in Jesus' name.
as we continue to worship with Cliff.